Okay. Thank you so much. Everybody is doing exactly what I asked. That's awesome. So your, your audio and video are off and that'll help us go through and make this um, uh, so that we can continue on. We totally appreciate you being here with everything that's going on right now. We're glad that some people have power and a lot of people are still in their homes and that, um, that you are safe. So we did wanna say that we do know that you probably have ash raining down on your um, vegetables and your house right now and with the wind. And we will, if you have questions about that, you might wanna put them in the chat. And, but really for, uh, we are having uh, forest fires. So it's not so much, um, uh, fires that are burning in a, in a big city. So the ash that's coming down should be safe on your vegetables. You absolutely want to go through and wash them first, um, just like you normally would with anything else that you pull out of your garden. So um, our Zoom talk is being recorded. Um, if you would like to change your name, um, feel free to do that. We are, we are allowing you to do that. Uh, we have three fabulous presenters today, and we're um, all master gardeners. And so all of master gardeners, we do more than just garden. We're helping you to go through and uh, nurture and protect your soil because the soil is what it takes. It's our lifeblood. We want to make sure that we do the best by that soil. We are planting the right plant in the right place at the right time. It saves everybody lots of problems if we do that. And the plant is much, much happier. Uh, we always use um, compost and organic amendments. We try not to use synthetic fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides. We want things that are slow acting that will they'll feed our soil. We use flowers that benefit um, not only the plants, but also the beneficial insects. And we practice minimal soil disturbance. And we will go through and give you some more tips on that um, today as well. Uh, we always mulch to save water and to prevent weeds. Um, today we have three presenters. And our first presenter is, and is uh, Elector Heister, and she is going to be, she is a master, master, master gardener, and she is going to be talking us, to us today on saving seeds. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about saving seed and specifically tomato seeds today. It's a big uh, topic, uh, not necessarily uh, tomato seeds, but saving seeds in general is a big topic. And if you haven't saved seed before, I just want to share three reasons, three of my top reasons for saving seed. And the first one might be that you all of a sudden have become or received seeds from your family uh, that have been grown for four or five generations and you are the caretaker. And um, it, we know that the seed is not available commercially. So you are the, you know, the seeds that you have will be the last of the generation unless you save them and, and uh, provide them for the next generation. Uh, another reason to save seed might be that you had uh, tomatoes you know, in particular this year that did unbelievably well. They were healthy all the way through the season. The flavor of the tomato couldn't have gotten better and you wanna duplicate your results next year, hopefully. That would be another reason to save seed uh, but my favorite reason for saving seed is to grow and share seeds for friends and family and community. And primarily because it makes our community more resilient. So here are a few general tips for saving seed if you're new to the topic. Um, first of all, we like to recommend that you use open pollinated seed. Now that sounds like a big term and it might be confusing for people. So I'm gonna just spend a minute or two describing what that means. Uh, generally, uh, home gardeners um, have access to open pollinated seeds or hybrid seeds. An open pollinated seed or variety 
is uh, the result of two parents that are very similar. And so the offspring becomes uh, very uniform like the parents. If you save seed from a hybrid, a hybrid is usually made up of two parents that are very dissimilar. So we discourage you from saving seed from hybrids because you're not going to necessarily get the results that you had the previous year. The, the seed will revert back to one or the other parent so you don't get the combined effect of that combination. So I hope that isn't too complicated. And if you have questions about that, please put them in the chat box. So when you're starting out with seed saving, um, I, we always recommend to start with easy crops and those are lettuce, peas, beans, and tomatoes. And they're easy because you don't have to worry necessarily too much about pollination, isolation distances, um, and the population size, which is a whole nother class unto itself. So if you want to start, just take my word for it, lettuce, peas, beans, and tomatoes. And we're going to cover tomatoes today. So as you're uh, deciding whether or not you want to save seed, I, we recommend that you always observe your plants throughout the season and perhaps tagging them to indicate which ones you feel like are really uh, doing well in your garden. So, and then the last thing, of course, is label your seed. Um, many people will have seed saved at the end of the season. Maybe they're saving more than one tomato. By the end of the drying process, the seeds look exactly the same. So if you haven't labeled them, you, it's very likely you could get them mixed up. So when you're getting ready to save your tomatoes for seed, uh, you wanna make sure that you're using a tomato that is perfectly ripe. So in this photograph, you'll see there are four different stages of ripeness. Obviously the green is very immature. And then we have different shades of orange and then we go to red. The one that you would want to choose is the very red larger tomato that's in the center of the photo. So when you're getting, when you've, you've selected your tomatoes and, and remember that it's always good to save more than one tomato per plant. I don't know many people who grow more than one variety of tomato at a time. I mean, one individual, let me see, how am I gonna say this? Um, if I had 10 tomatoes, I'm probably not going to grow two or three of the same kind, unless of course you're growing a paste tomato and you're making a lot of um, tomato sauce. So in the case, if you have only one tomato plant that you're saving seed from, make sure that you select several fruits from that plant. So you bring them in and then you cut them across the equator and then the photo on the right isn't necessarily prepared that way, but I wanted to show this to you because all of the tomato seeds have gel sacs around them. The reason for the gel sac is so that the tomato doesn't sprout and start growing while it's on the plant. So the next step after you've cut your tomatoes open <clears throat> is to squeeze the juice and the seeds into a container. It can be a bowl or a glass jar and uh, you'll sometimes get some pulp in the jar or the container. That's fine. Uh, if your tomato does not have a lot of juice, you might want to add a little bit of water. Uh, I'd say a half a cup. It depends on how many tomatoes you're trying to save seed from, but half a cup to a cup should be plenty. Uh, and then you, you're going to, you, you can, you have the option of obviously saving the tomato meat and any other pieces of the tomato uh, for making soup or sauce later. So after you've uh, gotten your seeds and your pulp and a little bit of water in your container, you're going to let it sit in the open air out of the sun for 24 hours up to four days. And the reason for that is because you want a mold to develop on the skin on the top of the liquid. The reason for the mold is so that it breaks down the gel sac. That way, when you have your seeds ready to plant next year, they will sprout. And, and that, that whole process of what is what we call the fermentation process. All right, so then 
when you've uh, you've noticed your mold has developed and you it's now time to wash the seeds and separate them. So what happens during the fermentation process is that the viable seeds, the ones that you want, sink to the bottom. And this is not a great photograph, but you can, there is a line of seeds sitting in the bottom of this jar. And you can also see there's pulp and uh, there are a few seeds floating in the top. So what you wanna do is pour off the top of the liquid with the seeds that, are, that you don't want and the pulp and then you wanna stop before you get to the seeds in the bottom. And once you've got the seeds in the bottom remaining, you're going to pour them into a strainer. Okay, so this is, these are the viable seeds that were sitting in the bottom of the jar, and you can see there's still some pulp here. You wanna uh, rinse this with a spray, uh, but be careful not to have your seeds splash out of the strainer. But get rid of as much pulp as you can. Then you, you start the drying process. So what you wanna do is, spread your wet seeds out on a flat surface in a single layer. And you wanna use something like a plate, a glass plate or a coffee filter. Um, on the left, you'll see uh, the photograph is from the Seed Savers Exchange in Iowa. This is their tomato drying room. And the reason you wanna have a, use a coffee filter or a, well, the coffee filter absorbs moisture, so that's terrific, but it, the seeds also don't stick to that and nor do they stick to the glass plate. And you wanna do this out of direct sunlight and it usually takes about a week. Uh, I usually let my seeds sit for a week at least. So um, this is the picture of the seeds after they've dried. You can see it has, it's a, quite a different look. There's no moisture whatsoever. And you can actually see the little hairs on the seed. This is how you know that they're dry. Um, so at this point, you want to use paper envelopes or uh, glass jars and seal them and label again, label, label, label. And the best place to keep your, um, your seeds is in a cool, dark, and dry location um, because that will slow down the uh, process by which um, the seeds generate their energy. And for, I just lost the word in my head, but I may think of it in a minute. Um, so if you, if you dry your seeds well and you store them well, tomato seeds can last anywhere from five years and beyond. So that is all I have to say on this topic right now. Uh, please, if you have questions, uh, add the questions to the uh, chat box and I will turn the program over to Kitty. So I'm going to talk about September in the garden and uh, this is, I have to admit that I took these pictures a couple weeks ago and since then September has been wackola. So this is, some of this is uh, generic information. And uh, if you have questions about the specifics of um, this year, you're gonna have to put them in the chat. So we're gonna talk about maintaining healthy vegetables. So at this time of year, you may look out at your garden like this and have too much of a good thing. This is the trombocino squash that outgrew two trellises and I have it now growing on strings and it's into the apple tree and the gutters. So one of the first things you may be doing out in your garden is assessing when plants have outgrown their space and you may be doing a lot of tying things up or having to consider cutting things back. This is the toolkit. It's in a bucket. I carry it with me out into the garden to be prepared. One of my favorite singers, Marsha Ball, sings a song called Right Tool for the Job. And these are the tools that I use. So from the left, you've got a ball of string cleverly inside a little container so that it doesn't get all yucky. Then you have loppers. Loppers are great for big, stems and you'll see later on me wrestling with a broccoli stalk. So here is that broccoli stalk, pretty thick. It's very dense and woody. 
don't try and do this with your small uh, hand pruners. You'll just ruin your tool. Then you have your hand pruners, your fine snips, a medium snip. You have something that's really good for shearing herbs. You have a harvest uh, knife that's really good for um, thinning. You have a little snakehead hoe that is good for getting weeds out. And then you have the fabulous hori hori. And the hori hori is a Japanese tool. One side is serrated, one side is sharp, sharp point. And this is an all purpose tool, really useful. Okay, so as you're moving through the garden, what you're doing, first you're gonna sterilize your tools because there may be diseased plants. There may be fungal disease or viruses or uh, insect eggs that you don't wanna transfer from plant to plant or uh, space to space. So you've got soapy water, please use biodegradable soap. You have a spray bottle of your chosen disinfectant that can be alcohol or that can be uh, something like Lysol, the original Lysol. And you're going to clean tools in between anything that you notice that's diseased. So as you um, are moving through your garden, you have to make decisions. You're assessing what needs to be harvested. You're assessing what is no longer productive. You are assessing what materials can go right into your compost pile because they are um, merely dead or still green. And then you're going to have something that is damaged or diseased, and that has to go into the green bin or the trash. So in looking at this plant, I really don't have to know exactly what is wrong with it to know that this has a lot of insect damage and that it should go directly into the trash. Almost no one has a home compost system that is hot enough to make sure that all uh, plant material that's diseased is uh, thoroughly heated long enough to kill all of the um, individual organisms. So don't even put it in your green waste can, put it into your trash. As I'm looking at this leaf from the bottom side, I notice that this damage has been done by um, an insect that is um, ready to uh, create the next generations. So these little insect eggs, I can identify these eggs and I know that they belong to a particular beetle. And you want to get rid of that insect damage. Again, this does not go into your compost. And this is the harlequin beetle that is causing that damage. And they'll be on your broccoli. I get them on squash, mostly brassicas, but sometimes on squash. And I am just picking them off and dropping them into some soapy water. I don't need to apply an insecticide. I don't need to put any chemicals on this plant. These guys are goners. So let's talk about weeds. Talking about favorite tools. So this is called a winged hoe. And this piece here is the wings. And it is designed to slide right under your weeds. Now this particular weed is in my path, but it's also everywhere in my beds. And um, once I take it out of the ground, I have to decide, where am I going to put the weeds? Well, if your weed is still in the green growing stage and doesn't reproduce by rhizomes, meaning like Bermuda grass, long root-like things that go under the ground forever. So on the left, you have the oxalis that's just green. And I could probably put this into my regular compost pile because it doesn't have any seeds. On the right, it's flowered, it's got seeds. And when you touch this plant, it's gonna shoot little poppers all over the place. So this definitely, you don't want to contribute to the green waste because then it becomes someone else's problem. So that goes in the trash too.
here we are in the cucumbers. Cucumbers have stopped producing. And this video may not, we may not have the bandwidth to do the video. Anyhow, imagine that you see that this cucumber is ready to come out. It's got some dead leaves. I don't have any more flowers, so I'm not anticipating further fruiting. I'm going to take it out the no-till way. So no-till means that I get underneath the ground at the base of that stem and I cut it out without removing the roots. The roots stay in the ground because in the no-till method, the least amount of soil disturbance. Also, I've mentioned before on this program that I am a small urban gardener in raised beds and that I don't have a lot of room. So here, in this video, I'm gonna talk you through it because I don't think we'll get to see it. You see that winter squash, and um, I'm looking at the color, and I'm looking uh, at the bottom of the squash, and imagine me picking it up and making sure it's not rotting underneath on my mulch, and I look specifically at the stem. If the stem is not brown, hard, and dry, I'm gonna put that squash back in the ground. I am not taking it off of the plant. If I'm not quite sure, I can take my thumbnail and run it along the, the rind of the squash and see if I leave a mark. And if I do, that squash is not yet uh, hardened off enough to be picked. You can probably leave, if you have space, your winter squash for a good month or, or more in the garden. Uh, think Halloween and Thanksgiving. The last thing I wanted to show you was that once you have products coming out of your garden, think about ways that you can use them and others can use them. So this was a lovely idea I saw at Bear Farm of uh, all the sunflowers that had been harvested and were snipped off and there was an entire block long fence full of food for the wildlife. So remember, as you're assessing what's going in your garden, take out what's ready to be harvested, make sure your tools are clean, sharp, and uh, dead, dying, diseased can come out. If you need to tie things up to get them off of the ground, that helps with insect control and enjoy your garden harvest. Now, let's see, we have Kathleen Fitzgerald Orr up next, and she's going to be talking about beneficial insects. Good afternoon, thank you for joining us. I'm gonna be talking about beneficial insects. So what are beneficial insects? Those are creatures in the garden that perform valuable tasks that support the environment. Insects are called pests when they harm, cause harm in our gardens. Even though there are about a million known pest species, insect species, only about one to 3% are ever considered pests. Beneficial insects are the unsung heroes of the vegetable garden. These insects are the best form of pesticides in the garden. So beneficial insects are vital to a successful garden and there's several different types. Predators are animals or insects that eat other insects, um, which are called prey. And they're usually very active because they have to hunt for the prey. They eat many pest insects and they're an important part in the natural control program in the whole garden. Uh, many uh, examples such as spiders, lacewings, some kinds of beetles. The next group is parasitides. They are small insects whose immature stages develop either within or attached to the outside of insects, which are referred to as hosts. They eventually kill the host they feed on, as opposed to parasites like fleas and ticks, which typically feed on hosts without killing them. There are two categories of parasitoids. One group hatches from within the host, from eggs or larvae laid there by an adult female, and then they feed and develop inside the host. And others are fastened to the outside of the host and feed through the host skin by sucking the body, the, um, out the body fluids. And lastly, pollinators. Pollination is the process by which plants reproduce and create seed. 
insects called pollinators are necessary to move pollen from one plant to another. Um, these include bees, wasps, beetles, butterflies, moths, and sometimes flies. And native bees and honeybees and butterflies help plants bear fruit. Notice that praying mantids are not considered beneficial because they eat both beneficials and pests. Entice these beneficial insects to your garden. You will attract more insects to your garden by avoiding the use of pesticides. Create an insectary as a garden plot just for insects by including a variety of native plants which will offer a variety of food sources like nectar. Provide a water source. This can simply be a watering hole using a saucer with some rocks. Be sure to replenish it on warm days. Notice in the lower left photo, the rock in the bird, on the bird bath on the right. Remember, most beneficial insects have wings. If a water source is not close by, they'll take off in search of what they need. Don't let their water dry up. And provide shelter by leaving leaf piles, tree stubs, hollow stems, and some bare soil for ground nesting bees. Yes, it's important to promote a healthy ecosystem in the garden. Thoughtful plant collection and proper site preparation are essential to developing a beautiful earth-friendly landscape. By selecting the right plant for the right place, you reduce the need for water, fertilizer, herbicides, pesticides, and flavor. It also creates a visually appealing landscape, prevents soil erosion, and supports our uh, beneficial insects. Keep your plants healthy. Remember, right place, right plant, right place as you design your garden. And provide a continuous food source. Plant sequentially flowering diverse species of plants that provide nectar and pollen year round. The more complex and diverse your landscape landscape is, the more likely beneficial insects will call it home. Have a balance in the garden. Think of your garden as a cafeteria for all sorts of insects. Focus on a habitat that is welcoming to natural enemies rather than having solely deal with insect pests. Maintain a balanced system, whether you cater to the pest insects or to the beneficial ones. One of these beneficial insects is the convergent lady beetle. It's one of the most common in North America. It goes through a complete metamorphosis, which means that the insect passes through distinct egg, larval, pupil, and adult stages. And the larva doesn't resemble the adult. And they also, the adults also have one to two generations per year. The adult has a shiny convex half dome shape with short clubbed antennae. They're, the larvae are active, elongate, and have long legs, and they resemble tiny alligators. The eggs are oblong, yellow, and measure about one millimeter in length, and they are laid on the end in groups, on end in groups, on leaves, stems, and near aphids. Pupation occurs in sheltered places along stems. Both adults and larvae feed primarily on white flies, other soft-bodied insects, and insect eggs. They can eat up to 5,000 aphids in their short lifespan. They also look for pollen as a source of food. Some of the preferred herbs and flowers include cilantro, dill, fennel, angelica, scented geraniums, and so on. They overwinter as adults, often in aggregations along hedgerows, beneath leaf litter, under rocks, and in special, in protected places, including buildings. In spring, the adults diverse, disperse in search of prey and suitable egg-laying sites. On to lacewings. Adult green lacewings are soft-bodied insects with four membered wings, golden eyes, and green bodies. They are beautiful to view. The females lay their tiny oblong eggs on silken stalks attached to the plant tissues. The larvae are flattened, tapered at the tail, and measure an eighth to four-fifths of an inch long and have distinct legs. And they possess prominent mandibles with which they attack their prey. Pupation occurs uh, attached to plants or under loose bar. They are general, green lacewings are general, general predators. The adults 
can often fly at night and are seen when drawn to lights. Some species are predators while others feed directly on honeydew, nectar, and pollen. They undergo complete metamorphosis with eggs hatching about four days after being laid and the larva develop through three instars before pupating. The larva, which are pale with dark markings, look like tiny alligators. They prey on a variety of small insects. And all stages survive the mild winters here in California. On to parasitic wasps. They range in size from very tiny. Some can fly through the eye of a needle to about one and a half inch long. The eggs are rarely seen. They're usually inserted. Um, within the eggs or bodies of host insects. The larvae are typically not seen, although some can be glimpsed as a dark shape within the egg or body of the host insect. Parasitic wasps may be seen uh, as small, whitish yellowish rice-like cocoons on or near parasitic insects, and you see that on the right side of the, of the slide. Gardeners are more likely to see the results of parasitic par parasites activities than the wasps themselves. They are very sensitive to insecticides, so avoid the use of chemical sprays. Most of the adults feed on plant sugars and fluids. Best nectar sources are flowers that can be easily reached for nectar, such as members of the carrot and cabbage families. Plants with floral nectaries, which are nectar producing glands physically apart from the flower are also important sources of food. And that's pictured in the top right uh, picture. Plants that provide shade on hot summer days are a big help. And a parasitic wasp is known to parasitize over 200 species of common garden pests. And they're not interested in humans, therefore they do not sting. Know your pests, identify them, make sure it's not actually a beneficial. Decide how many pest insects are tolerable. If you're not raising vegetables, some damage is okay. Um, that is, if you're not raising vegetables for com commercial purposes. Some ways to handle um, the pests are the use of pheromone traps, row covers, and even a strong water spray that may be beneficial. One thing to remember with soft body pests is to spray them with water aiming for their lateral sides because their breathing apparatus are located there. Um, these are called stomata and, the, and so they will suffocate when you do this. Remember some pests are necessary to feed beneficial insects and some plant damage is natural in any ecosystem. Be patient and think of some of the alternative control manners while methods while you wait for beneficials to take over for you. On our website in UCANR, there is a uh, beneficial poster that's available to, down, uh, to uh, download and it's wonderful. It shows the different uh, life stages of many of our beneficial insects and the uh, site is, is located on the so, left. Threats to pollinators and other beneficials. We are becoming more and more well aware of these. Uh, some of them are habitat loss, degradation, and fragmentation of the environment. As native vegetation is replaced by roadways, manicured lawns, crops, and non-native gardens, pollinators lose their food and nesting sites that are necessary for survival. Habitat degradation, the decline in habitat quality, is another serious concern. And bees, uh, ground nesting bees often don't have a place to develop their nests. Non-native plants or animals brought here from other places decrease the quality of poll pollinator habitat. Studies predict that climate change will alter the close relationship between insect pollinators and the plants that depend upon them. Pollinating pollinator insects uh, the scent of a flower is not just a sensory treat, it is the means by which insects find their way to essential resources. How can we support our pollinators? Well, become a wildlife gardener, plant natives, diversify your gardens in size, shape, and color, give bees and other po pollinators resting place, nesting places, avoid pesticides, plant milkweed, protect grasslands. 
And lastly, thank you for watching. And remember, there is no planet B. We are all in this endeavor together. And now we're going to go through some questions and answers. There was a question, Kitty. Uh, um, somebody has a limited number of raised beds and they use them for both spring and fall plantings. So what's the best way to prepare the soil in between the plantings? So uh, because of the limited area, um, you don't have the luxury of things like green manure crops very often, except maybe uh, after you've cleaned out an entire bed. But compost, compost, compost. So after you cut your plant off at soil level and you remove that plant and any of the plant material, you can put another half an inch, inch, even two inches of compost right on top of the soil. And you don't have to worry about digging that compost in. So thinking about this has really changed in the last um, decade or so that it used to be, oh, turn the soil, incorporate organic matter. No, lay your compost on and then replant and make sure that you mulch. Is that it? That, that sounds great, yeah. And I, you know, if you, if you notice, I had a couple of beds that were really hard when I'm trying to go in and add things in. That lets me know that probably whatever I've been doing on that particular bed wasn't quite right. And so now I'm changing because not all the beds were that way. So you may, you know, it, the best case is to lay, them right, lay it right on top. Oh, no. Electra, I've got a question for you. Sure. Um, Georgia asks, my squa squash plants are still producing, but the leaves are getting uh, dry mold. Should you, she cut the leaves off or remove the whole plant? I would cut some of the leaves off, but obviously you need some of those to continue um, the growth of the plant. And, you know, I would also say, are your are your, is your plant producing more flowers? That, that to me is the key. Uh, you could have fruit on the plant that's getting ready to be harvested, but are, is the plant continuing to produce new flowers, which means it's still got enough energy to produce more fruit down the line. If it's not, I would take it out. That sounds great. Yes, go ahead, Kitty. So I've recently discovered that you can stake your zucchini. So I have a long zucchini that's traveled maybe three feet from its root and all the lower leaves have died off and done their job but I'm still getting fruit at the end. I can cut everything off along the stem up to where it's fruiting and I can tie it up like a little tree and uh, it will continue to bear and so it, it sort of takes out that you know, zucchini take a lot of room in a tiny garden. So stake it up and underplant. And there's, there's a question from Catherine Mock who asks, she has sunflowers that have died off. Do I pull them, pull out the whole plants, the roots and all? And Ellie did respond to that, which was awesome. She, in the chat, she said that, you know, use no-till. I have lots of sunflowers also. And um, I think that that whole root system, if you do cut it off just underneath the soil, um, then it can go ahead and decompose and it will be no-till. Sometimes though, I've got them that spring up in the beds and they get to be, you know, the diameter probably is three inches or more of the uh, stalk. And you, you sort of have to, you know, decide as you go down in to cut it off I have to use a saw to cut off some of mine so <laughs> you want to make sure but you know note to self don't let them grow in the beds would be a nice thing to do so um Electra did you have something to add to that uh, not about sunflowers but I did notice there was a question about um tomatoes, tomatoes. And whether they're self-pollinated or cross-pollinated tomatoes okay. are self-pollinated, which means the plant takes care of its pollination before the flower opens. However, there are always exceptions to the rule. 
And some flowers have the anther, which is the part of the flower that carries the pollen. Um, some of those anthers protrude outside the flower itself. In that case, bees could come along, pluck off some of that pollen, and then deposit it to another flower that also might have a, an extended uh, anther. So there are ways that a, a tomato can get crossed, but typically they're self-pollinated, which means you don't have to worry. And I encourage everybody to, to do exactly what Electra told you to do about saving the tomato seeds, because everybody loves their tomatoes. And it feels so good to plant those same seeds that did so well for you. Um, let's see, Electra, this question also is for you. Um, it's from Tommy Smith, and she asks, should Tommy. Seeds, Tommy, should <laughs> seeds be saved in the refrigerator or the freezer? And that was a great question. All right, well, so I would say it uh, depends on, th there are three sort of categories of where to store your seeds. You can store your seeds in a desk drawer uh, if you're only planning to hold them for a year and you're going to replant them next year or next season. But the temperature in that drawer needs to be consistent over time and not vary up and down. Um, then the next level would be to put uh, your dried seeds into a jar with a seal and put it in the refrigerator. The reason the seal is important is because the refrigerator typically is a very moist environment. Uh, so you want to make sure moisture does not get into the jar. So the word that I was looking for bef uh, before I finished my uh, presentation was metabolism. And so what happens is uh, a seed in order to germinate needs light moisture uh, to germinate. So, and it needs warmth. So when you add moisture into a, a stored seed, it's going to start metabolizing faster. You don't want that if you're trying to store them for a longer period of time. Now you can also freeze your seeds. That is for a longer um, timeline, um, but either refrigerator or freezer will work for, for most seeds. It just depends on how long you want to store them and whether or not you have good packaging and keeping all the elements out. Thank Tommy, you. I hope that helps. <laughs> there's another, there's a question for Kathleen. Um, Kathleen, uh, how do you make sure that there's no tiny bugs? Oh, well, this tiny bugs on your seeds. So we'll let Kathleen do that one. And then Electra, if you have something to add, feel free. I'm going to actually bunt that to back to Electra because okay. I think that's more her field. So there are bugs on the seeds, is that? They want to make sure that there's no little tiny bugs in the seeds. Like for instance, oh, I did okay. amaranth and you know, the seeds are so tiny and then you end up getting little tiny bugs in there. So, okay. so this typically happens with seeds like peas and bees, beans. So what we do um, is after the seeds have dried, we put them in the freezer and that will, for several days, say two or three days, in a, you know, a good uh, container, uh, like a, a Ziploc bag with a good seal on it, put it in the freezer for several days, and then take it out. That will kill any bugs that uh, actually got into the seed during the growing season. That's a, that's hope a that great helps. question. So, Kitty. <laughs> There's a question about um, mulch. And in my vegetable raised beds, I prefer to use straw, uh, not hay, oat straw. It has the least number of weeds. And on some very delicate kind of crops, sometimes I will use, um, oh, Tommy Smith is going to have to help me here, rice hulls, rice yeah. hulls. But you need a couple inches of rice hulls and then yeah, but straw, straw is a great mulch inside your beds. And then um, once it's started to decompose uh, after a season or so, you can add it to your compost as your browns 
and uh, that's a pretty good thing. There's a question on here about flea beetles on eggplant. Oh, Toby. <laughs> There's always flea beetles on eggplants. So I think the flea beetles, well, that probably is the best question for Kathleen, but I want to go back to the mulch question. And part of that mulch question was in fire country. And I know what they're saying. If you take, you know, you really need a good layer of mulch. So I use rice straw. I mean, you can use whatever straw that you want to, but um, you know, when the weather's like this and you're putting out, you know, more flammable um, product in your garden, you, you, it does make you pause and think, is there something better? You can always use extra compost as a mulch on top. And I think the rice holes probably would be less flammable. So hopefully you've gotten, you've designed your garden beds so that there's space between them. So they're little islands rather than, you know, just one continuous big bed that's ready to burn. So we have lots of- Also, also yeah. you've kept your vegetables and your other plants healthy and watered. So there's not a lot of flammable stuff left. You have removed it as uh, things dry out. You're removing them right. and you're making sure that that material is not lying around. So if it's in your compost bin, you're watering it. And if it's not, it's in your trash or in your green bin where it is contained. So if you've been maintaining your garden, it's a green space. It is not a dried out fire hazard. Right, right. And, you know, you may decide to save some, some bean seeds that are super fun to save and real easy. Um, but you do have to let them sit on the vines until they're fully matured. So you don't have to leave your whole bean trellis up. You can cut out lots of it and save a couple of, you know, um, good plants that have several um, pods on them that you're going to keep. Because really, think about how many bean seeds you're gonna need for next year. Not a whole bunch, okay? So maybe 20, and that would be great. But um, yeah, keeping up with your garden. So, okay. Toby, can I add something about that? Absolutely. So if you are uh, worried about the beans, uh, vegetative material being dry and sitting there waiting for the fire to come. If most of the plant is ready to harvest or most of the beans are ready to harvest, you can actually pull the whole plant and just pull it, put it into your garage and let it continue to dry down there. And you could get it out of the garden if you think it's a fire hazard. Also, uh, there's been an ongoing conversation uh, among master gardeners recently, uh, the food gardening specialists about tomatoes as a particular case of removing the entire plant, root and all. Mm. And um, we're sort of open to the idea that tomatoes might have a propensity for disease, wilts, and that you might want to take the plant out root and all, but that's, um, you know, it's a, something for discussion. Also, we can't recommend a brand of soap. Someone asked that question for dropping your bugs in. However, the key word is soap, not detergent. You're not putting detergent into your garden. And, you know, try it with no soap. Try plain water first. And if they don't die, <laughs> then put a drop of soap, not detergent. Excellent. That sounds great. Now, here's some resources for you. You, this whole presentation will be available. Let me get my cursor out of the way. I tell you, um, it will be available on our website. So you will have that. Um, but you may just want to take a picture of this last slide so that you can get some of these resources now. Um, we have a wealth of information on our website. It's really awesome. And this, the first link up at the top was made and it talks about, you know, gives you links for other things that, that the things that we have talked about today. Um, 
And just for your information, Kathleen Fitzgerald Orr, who talks to you on the insects, um, she was one of those folks that, um, and probably still does this at points, answers questions um, at the, the desk. And so there's an email still here. They're not physically in the office at this point, but if you email your questions in, we have master gardeners that love to do it and they will research your question and send you information back. So obviously be as specific as you possibly can. But you know, before you go too far, I would go to our website and the IPM website gives you lots of specific information similar to what Kathleen was telling you. All right. Okay, well, thank you so much. And remember, if you don't, don't worry too much about the, the ash that's falling down, unless you have to evacuate, obviously. But, um, you know, give your plants a little TLC, see if you can, you know, nurse them along a little bit during this tough time. And hopefully by tomorrow, our weather will be back to normal and um, they can start growing again. So. Thank you so much for joining us.